Thanks to Care of for sponsoring this video. Guys, we are gathered here today for a very important discussion. A discussion about the new Netflix Persuasion movie. Yes, I know I'm about to get into all the drama because I feel like there's just so much drama surrounding this movie. I mean, you can't put out like a totally modernized version of a Jane Austen classic without the internet going insane. But in this video, I'm gonna be sharing how I feel about it. I'm gonna be analyzing the impact that this modernization of the storytelling has both on our understanding of the era and our understanding of our own era and on Jane Austen's book itself. So if you wanna learn all about that, then definitely stay tuned for today's video. So I have to admit, when I very first saw the trailer for the new Persuasion, I was shocked. I went into watching the trailer like, thinking maybe one or two things would concern me. Guys, me watching the trailer was staring at my phone going, what, 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 what just happened? I could not comprehend the trailer the first time I watched it. I had to watch it multiple times. But I feel like once I processed, okay, they did this to the story, they modernized it this much, by the time I watched the movie, I was prepared for it. And it actually allowed me to enjoy the movie a lot more. What I really love about this adaptation is the fact that I feel like it's an artifact of our time. And it demonstrates so much about modern society in comparison to Regency society because it's a modern take on a classic text. It's like one of those picture games where you can like spot the differences. And then if you compare those differences and you ask why is it different, that tells you a lot about the cultural shifts that have happened over the past 200 years. And so really, I think just from a sociological viewpoint, this movie is fascinating. Now let's talk about exactly how they modernized the story here. Because what they did is they kept it set in about 1817, but they modernized the character's world of views. We see the characters speaking and thinking as modern people, but living in the houses, wearing the clothes, engaged in the activities and within the social structure of the Regency era. So this is a very different form of modernization versus say Clueless, where they literally took Emma and they put it in 1995. And by keeping it in the historical time period, it also creates massive problems that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But before we dive into this analysis, I first want to say thanks to Kerav for sponsoring this video. Like I mentioned in my recent video on goal setting, I'm really working on my health and taking supplements regularly, but I'm someone who really struggles with remembering to take them every day and buy them and put them in the pill thing. Anyway, that's where Kerav has come in and completely changed my supplement game. Care of is a subscription service that can ship high quality supplements, vitamins, and powders to you every month. And I love the fact that my vitamin packets come in little packets with my name on them and they're made of compostable film, which is also epic. And I really do feel like it's helping me work towards my health goals of bouncing back from burnout. I've been taking their Rodiola, I can't say it, Rodiola, and their Shatavari. Wow, I can't say any of these supplements. I definitely have been feeling energized, but also just more focused and less stressed and on top of things, which is really nice. These are some supplements that I had not really heard of before taking the quiz on their website. Kerov has this wonderful quiz that can help guide you through choosing supplements that will help you work towards your health goals. So if you would like to start working towards your health goals with Care Of, then definitely click the link in the description below to take Care Of's quiz and find out what it recommends for you. And use my code Dashwood for 50% off your first order. Now that we know the awesomeness of Care Of, let's talk about Netflix persuasion. Now, why would they do this though? Why would they make the characters speak and act like people from 2022 when it's supposed to be set in 1817? Well, this all goes back to what I was talking about in my video on things to know before reading Pride and Prejudice. People struggle 
with Jane Austen, not because of the clothes, not because of the fancy houses, but with the characters' worldviews. The worldviews is what makes the characters unrelatable, it's what makes them hard to understand, it's what makes them act in strange ways that just don't translate and connect with us today. And by doing away with that, I think their ultimate goal was to make a movie that people could instantly connect with without that barrier of 200 years of differences between them. Basically, it feels like they took Jane Austen's original text and they tried to translate the entire thing through the mindset of modern society. And that's why we get shifts in all those worldview aspects, including language. I think something fascinating is with how they handled Anne's younger sister, Mary. Mary as Jane Austen wrote her, is very self-absorbed, she's very complaining, and she's a hypochondriac. Jane Austen loved writing hypochondriacal characters. But it's interesting because the way Mary came through this modern translation was she gets called a narcissist, she gets very into self-care, self-love. So basically the movie's using those modern terms that Jane Austen would not have even known or been familiar with to describe the same behavior. It's like how someone would describe that person today versus how someone would have described them in 1817. There's that language shift there and they shifted it into modern terms. That would of course definitely help modern watchers connect with it more. I know I'm gonna have like a whole subsection of you guys watching this being like, yeah, but Ellie, I would have understood if they had used the other terms I understand Austin awesomely, and that is epic, and that is awesome, but I don't think the movie was made for you. And I think that's interesting because I feel like you know, this movie was not aimed at diehard Jane Austen fans. It was aimed at everybody else. It was aimed at the one-star reviews on Amazon people. This is my theory. Now this example I've been talking about with Mary and her self-care is very surface level and it was a translation that took an idea from 1817 and it translated it into the equivalent of 2022. However, that's not how they handled all of that modern translation. What they seemed to do a lot was they took an idea from 1817, for example, Anne Elliot's personality, and they replaced it with the acceptable 2022 alternative. And we got a completely new, different, and very modern, empowered, saucy, witty, completely opposite of Anne Elliot in the book personality. Now, why? Why would the modernization of the story require a complete reversal of Anne Elliot's personality? And I think one of the main reasons is because what modern society thinks is acceptable in a woman and in a heroine of a story is the opposite of what would have been acceptable in 1817. Jane Austen's original Anne Elliot is incredibly self-sacrificing, reserved. She's almost kind of a martyr, honestly. And those things are not the traits of an empowered woman in 2022. I mean, let's face it, we kind of live in a society that doesn't super appreciate quiet inner strength that gets overlooked by everyone until people finally realize that you're awesome because somebody jumped off of a thing and broke their head. What it does value is the saucy, witty, empowered woman that Anne Elliot becomes in the new version. Over the past 200 years, society's view of women has changed and society's view of morality is changed. A lot of the reason Anne Elliot is the way she is in the book is because she is deeply religious and she's very conservative. We have her judging her cousin, Mr. Elliot, for traveling on Sunday. However, here in this new version, we have Anne Elliot not being that religious. And in fact, she's fully approving of her friend going off and having romantic liaisons on the European continent. On a more technical aspect of turning the book of persuasion into a movie, I think one of the biggest difficulties everyone has always had is so much of persuasion is carried by Anne's inner world and also by Jane Austen's witty narration. Now here's the thing about Austen. Austen was not her characters. She was definitely not an Anne Elliot in real life, personality-wise. And I think that shows part of Austen's genius that she was able to create believable characters that were so different from herself. 
Now, I think one of the reasons Anne Elliot's character also changes dramatically is because they were trying to incorporate that narration into how they're having her tell the story. Now, when you start merging Jane Austen's narrative voice with the personality of the main character, that's going to shift the way the character comes off. They're going to become a lot more like Austen and a lot less like themselves. And I feel like that is another thing they were trying to do is merge Austen into Anne when they are nothing like each other in real life. Not that Anne was ever in real life, but y'all know what I'm saying. Of course, another major thing that changed in this adaptation was the Wentworth Anne relationship dynamic. Yes, this is making me face palm because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> like, oh. So, of course, we know in the original story, they don't communicate and they're just sort of both isolated, get together and in their own pain and they just can't, they just can't get together and talk about stuff, honestly, is part of the whole problem of persuasion. Well, in this movie, that's not a problem. They communicate a lot. They communicate all over the place, which of course destroys the entire dynamic, but again, is from that different place of approaching relationships. There was a lot of things they couldn't do and they couldn't say because of social restrictions in the Regency era. And those are not really relatable, I feel like, to a lot of people today. I've seen literal reviews of Austin's works where people are like, why can't anyone just have a conversation? And I feel like that was what we were seeing in the movie is modern people being like, maybe y'all just should talk. And they did, they talked so much. Of course, when you modernize everything in a story so much, that creates the opportunity for several different kinds of problems to arise. And I feel like one of the most noticeable ones was the fact that the deep culture did not match the surface culture in their world building. So like I've talked about in my video on is your society like the Regency era, cultures have deep culture, which is things like their ideals and worldviews and thoughts on women and equality and all of those different things. That's their deep culture. And then there's the surface culture and that stuff like architecture and clothing and food, the things you can see. And what's really interesting is the fact that they completely modernized the deep culture while keeping the surface culture completely 1817, more or less. Now, one of the main problems with this is the fact that surface culture comes from deep culture. So for example, something as simple as women's clothing comes from the deep culture beliefs about women, what they should wear, modesty, singleness versus marriedness, and their views on that. So all of the things we see come from the things we don't see in people's brains. And because they changed everything in people's brains, naturally everything we see physically should have also changed and it didn't. They also did not change the social structures. You definitely still had the landed gentry. You definitely had the admirals in the navy still. But as a consistent world, it doesn't add up because the ideas changed, but the social structure and the visible culture did not. Now, while this movie is definitely a very obvious example of this, this is something that actually comes up in a lot of historical fiction and period dramas. And I feel like a topic that this often becomes an issue with is feminism. So both Captain Wentworth and Anne Elliot come off as very feminist in this movie. We have Captain Wentworth apologizing for being overprotective. Let's face it, no Regency man would ever apologize for being protective of a woman he was currently escorting along a path. Not only would he not apologize for that, he would have viewed that as his duty. That was a gender specific role for gentlemen to protect ladies they are walking with. So right there, we see this massive world view shift in Captain Wentworth's mind from women need protected to women are empowered and can make their own choices and can get hit on by random guys if they want to right? That's a pretty big shift they make right there. And again, in that same scene, Captain Wentworth tells Anne that she would make a great admiral if only society didn't pretty much restrict her. And there are even more feminist moments in this movie. However, let's take this and compare it to the book. Is Jane Austen's Persuasion a feminist book? I would definitely say Jane Austen was progressive on this topic. But what's so interesting, Jane Austen's feminism while being progressive for her era, honestly, most people don't even know she was being progressive. 
because things have changed so much. People have lost so much of what was expected of women that they don't even know that Jane Austen was breaking the mold. So in the book, we have Mrs. Croft traveling with her husband in the Navy. And in the book, she defends women and says, but I hate to hear you talking as if women were all fine ladies instead of rational creatures. We none of us expect to be in smooth water all our days. Now, that might seem very bland for women's empowerment now. It's like, oh, we're rational creatures. That's, that's a bold move right there. But no, that was a bold move. Women in the 1800s were viewed as irrational, emotional, sentimental, and dumb. So really that statement in itself was really progressive for Austin's time. But the thing is, is it's not that progressive for our time. So I do think they translated feminism into terms of 2022. And this is not the only movie that does that. I feel like another great example is one of the more recent Little Women adaptations where they have Amy March go on this diatribe about women's rights. Now what she's saying is true, but the way she's talking about it is not how women in the era, even feminist women in the era, would have. Why is that? Now, the reason for that is because feminists in 1817 or 1850 did not view the topic the same way as feminists in 2022 do. Because in between these two points is 200 years of societal evolution. So for a minute, let's just talk about the progressive evolution of thought is what I've decided to name this, which is basically if you think about the way that ideas change through generations, we're all pretty familiar with the fact that obviously in the Regency era, married women more or less had no legal rights. And then as time went on, they gained the right to have custody of children. They gained the right to vote. They gained the right to own their own money and have their own bank accounts. They had the right to get divorced. They they gained many rights over the past 200 years. But the thing is, is that was a slow and progressive movement that happened. That was an idea that very slowly evolved over time. It didn't go from zero to 100 all at once. So if we imagine this topic as a spectrum from women not being equal at all to complete equality, society was slowly shifting towards more and more equality over time. Now, that was society's viewpoint as a whole. There were always the more progressive aspects of society that were always leaning a couple steps ahead of the general population. And there were always those more conservative side that were leaning a couple steps behind. Like I talk about the guy who only wanted to see women at church because that's where they belonged. He's a perfect example of someone who wasn't happy with all this progress. But the thing is, is the progressives of any era were only really a few steps ahead of the general population of the era, right? So Jane Austen being progressive by saying women were rational creatures, she's out ahead of society a little bit by about one or two steps. She's not 20 or 25 or 200 steps ahead of society because at that rate, she would just have been seen as crazy. But the thing is, is feminism in 2022 is like 200 steps ahead of feminism in 1817. So when making someone progressive in a historical movie, what someone needs to do is make them only like two steps ahead of society at large. But what movie makers tend to do is make them 200 steps ahead of everybody else. But basically with this adaptation of persuasion, they have Captain Wentworth and Anne 200 steps ahead when it comes to feminism instead of two, which means they would have either been seen as completely insane by everyone else, or if they were really only two steps ahead of society, then society would be different. And we go back to the whole, the deep culture would have changed the surface culture and Anne would have been able to be an admiral. Anyway, that's just one example of the problems with world building when you do this deep culture versus surface culture thing. Another problem that came up with the way they changed the story and the way they changed the character is, is the fact that it pretty much wiped out a lot of Jane Austen's messages. The things she was trying to say, it completely foiled the foils. For example, one of you guys submitted a question to me about why Louisa jumps off the wall at Lyme. I think the exact terminology was, is she some kind of dummy? The answer is the reason Louisa jumps off the wall in line is that she is a foil character of Anne Elliot. If you don't know what foils is, I have a whole video 
on it. Anyway, but basically her characteristics and her personality is highlighting Anne's personality because it's the opposite. We see Louisa being very self-willed and determined and she's gonna jump off the wall even though Captain Wentworth told her not to because in an earlier conversation, Captain Wentworth was like, hey, being self-willed is awesome. So she's gonna impress him. Yeah, that's why she jumps off the wall. And she's also trying to flirt with Captain Wentworth, but that's, you know, that's a side point. Anyway, that's why Louisa jumps off the wall in the book. Now, that moment is actually vital to the story. It's vital to Captain Wentworth's story arc. It says about that moment when Louisa jumps off the wall and breaks her head, there he had learned to distinguish between the steadiness of principle and the obstinacy of self-will, between the darings of heedlessness and the resolution of a collected mind. Basically, it made him realize Louisa's personality is not that great and Anne Elliot's is awesome because it's the opposite of that. And that's an example of a foil character earning their pay there, making that main character look awesome. Now, of course, they completely do away with all of that by changing Louise's character in the movie. She's honestly a lot cooler in the movie. She seems like a lot better friend, way funner to hang out with, but she almost seems to trip off of that wall like it was an accident. And I think that obviously destroys the entire foil Wentworth doesn't have that moment. He's just in love with Anne because he's just always been in love with Anne. And so I think that's just one of the things where it shows that by changing something as simple as Louisa's personality and her motive for jumping off the wall changes something that was very, very deeply plotted into the book by Jane Austen. I could give way more examples of that, but this video is already too long and I've already rambled about so much random stuff. Anyway, the overall message is they modernize the story by modernizing the deep culture while they maintain the surface culture. This created a lot of problems and it also teaches us so much about our modern world. It teaches us what people will accept as a heroine versus what was acceptable as a heroine in 1817 and the evolution of those ideas over the past 200 years. What do you have to say, baby? My cat would like to add that she didn't appreciate that Anne had a bunny instead of an adorable cat, though I did think the bunny was also very cute. But it should have been a cat, huh, baby? I think she might want food, so I need to wrap this up. But anyway, let me know in the comments down below, what did you think about this new Persuasion adaptation? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Are you not even gonna watch it because you're anti-Netflix? Let me know in the comments down below. And remember to definitely check out this video sponsor, Care Of, by clicking the link below and getting 50% off your first order with my code Dashwood. And keep having an awesome day, because you're awesome. Bye! Hey baby fluff! You, you should come up here and say hi to everybody. Come say hi! I don't know if you can see her. Oh, you can. And it has a lot of modern witty people very upset about it. My cat's so upset he had to leave because we're discussing it. He's just such a Jane Austen fan.